Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord. It's a great word. You are a great God. And now we pray, great God, that you would teach us, be a great teacher this morning to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 47, verse 29, started the last three verses here of this chapter, getting into the next chapter, 48. The time drew nigh that Israel must die, Genesis 47, 29. The time drew nigh that Israel must die. He called his son Joseph, said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swear unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the head, the bed's head. Going on to the next chapter. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give thee this land and thy seed after thee for an inheritance for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came into thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Sibion, they shall be mine. And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way. When there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. Now, in our last study, you remember we saw this very sobering statement that verse 29 starts off with, which said, Israel must die. I mean, what a statement that is. Israel must die. The time drew nigh that Israel must die. I mean, really to see the power of that statement, you really have to kind of substitute the name Israel for the meaning of what does Israel mean? What does the name Israel mean? E, it's made up of three words. Ish, Sar, El. Ish, Sar, El. So Ish is man, and Sar is prince, and, and El is God. So really the, 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 the word Israel man means the man who is the prince of God. Now let's plug it into verse 29 and see how it comes out. The time drew near that the man who is the prince of God must die. That's something. Even the man who is the prince of God, who had power over the angel, he had to die. So what it shows us is that death is unavoidable for us. We all must die. Hebrews 9.27, as it says, Hebrews 9.27, it's an appointed time. It's appointed unto us once to, unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And since the Lord only wants what's good for us, and he tells us that in Psalm 84.11, Psalm 84.11, which says, the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So we shouldn't fear death. I mean, uh, 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 Clinton Perry pointed out to me last week uh, from this verse in, 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 in 2 Timothy 1.10, that it's, that, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Those are very comforting. Very comforting words to know that the Lord doesn't recoil from death. I've got to get this set up here somehow. I don't know where it came to. Anyway, the Lord doesn't recoil from death when it comes time to die. Well, what he does is he sends his angels, very special very special. He sends his angels to carry home to be with him his saint. How do we know that? Because that's what it says about the beggar in Luke 16.22. See, Luke 16.22 says, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. He was buried. So it's such a special thing. It's such a precious time, death, when it talks about in Psalm 116.15, Psalm 116.15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, that's what's happening here. I mean, the, de- the time of Jacob's death is it's drawing closer. It's getting closer. The man who, this is the man, this is the man here, Jacob, who we have come to know him very well. We've come to love him. And we see that he's coming now to die. So really, 
Uh, verse 29 it's kind of like an invitation for a memorial service for, for Jacob. I mean, we're in the mood of memorial services now. And, and, and only he's not dead yet, you know, but, but we still want to look back a little bit over Jacob's life here because it's coming time. And, and when you look back over Jacob, Jacob's life, like in a memorial service, I mean, what do you see in Jacob's life? And you look in the, in the book of Genesis and you look back over this life of this man, what do you see? I mean, we followed him from his birth, and what do we see at his birth? Struggle. He's struggling with his brother Esau he, he, to be born first, and the baby is trying to, to, to grab his heel and pull him back. He said, yeah. so I'm going to go out there first, you know. And, and then what do we further see in his life? Struggle. He struggles again with his brother Esau. His, bro- he, his brother Esau has got the right of the firstborn, and, and, he, and he, he struggles with him and gets him to sell his right of his firstborn uh, to, to him. And then what happens? He leaves home. He has to run away from home, actually. And he struggles. He struggles with, with, with well, actually, we could say that he struggles with his father to, to get that blessing of the firstborn. He has to deceive his father. So forth. And, then, and, then we see, and then when he finally runs away from home, we see him struggling again with Laban to get Rachel his, for his wife and, and the cattle. And then, and then finally, he's, we, we see him struggling with God in Genesis 32. He struggles with God and he says, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. So he's struggling. And, 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 and not finally, but actually he goes on and he's struggling with his children to find out what did you do to Joseph? What did you do to him? So when you look back over this life, you just see it's one struggle after another. It's a life of struggling. And, and that's why when he described his life to Pharaoh, as we already saw in Genesis 47, 9, Genesis 47, 9, he said to Pharaoh, few and evil have been the days of the life uh, of my life been. Why, why is it called? But that's what, it, that's what a life of struggling is. A life of struggling is, is it's evil. And, and, and that's what we've come to understand about Jacob's life as we look back over it. It's, just, it's a life of one struggle after another. And, 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 and why, why was all the struggling? Because there was something that he said when he woke up from that infamous dream that night in Genesis 28 where he saw the ladder. And, 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 and we get an idea here of why he was struggling so much in life because he said, in Genesis 28, 20, monumental words in his life, Genesis 28, 20, Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on it so that I come again unto my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Now, what that shows us there is the reason why his life was a continuum of struggles. Because when he said, God, if you meet all these conditions, then, then you will be my God. Well, okay. Well, I mean, that said it all. <laughs> you know, that said it all. It showed us the simple truth at that point in his life. The fact was the Lord was not his God. That's it. He said, if you do all these things, then the Lord will be my God, which meant that the Lord was not his God. So when Jacob said that the Lord was not his God, that simply meant that Jacob didn't take his orders from God. He didn't take his orders every moment from, of his life from God. It simply meant that Jacob did not make decisions in his life based on what God as his master wanted. No, that wasn't part of the equation. So what we see in the life of Jacob is what happens to any person when the Lord is not his God. And all this that we just went over, all these heartbreaking really heartbreaking struggles that we've seen in the life of Jacob is what happens to a person who says, the Lord's not my God, that's all. I'm not saying God is not God. I'm not saying I don't believe in God. I'm not saying he's not, he's not the Lord. He's just not my personal God. He's not my God. And so when God is not in the driver's seat in a person's life, and, and when a person doesn't see himself as owned and managed by God and really put himself in that position, when a person sees himself as, no, I'm the master of my own destiny. I make my own decisions. You know, when a person lives like Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way, which means I didn't do it God's way. I did it my way. 
That's the life of a person who is saying, the Lord is not my God. That's, that's very simple. Now, and that's why we really love and we appreciate the life of, of Jacob because we identify with it. We identify with it because if we're all honest, we, 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 we were in the same boat. And, 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 and we, 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 will, we will make the same confession as Jacob did when he wrestled with God, which was so interesting back there in Genesis 32, 27. In Genesis 32, 27, God, the man who was God, who was wrestling with Joseph, uh, Jacob, he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now, you read something like that, and you think, that's almost laughable. I mean, he, he's been wrestling with this person all night long, and it's like, you know, and God's saying, wait a minute, I forgot, I forgot his name. I say, it's, getting, it's getting a little hard now, but what was your name again? <laughs> it's like, that's not what happened. I mean, obviously, God didn't forget the name of the person he was wrestling with, but God wanted Jacob to make this confession because the name that was given to Jacob at his birth was the name that characterized the struggle. Yuck, the, the heel grabber is what Jacob means because he was grabbing the heel of Esau. Coming out of the birth canal there, he's grabbing the heel of, J, of Esau. So, so he, he said, what's in your name, God says. And, and, and so he, he, he brings this point out, who are you really? Who, who really are you? And, and God is wanting us to make the same confession to him and say to, say to God, yeah, my name is Jacob's also. My name is Jacob's also because there's a Jacob inside of me, right? A Jacob who has gone through life from one struggle to another, living a life without the Lord as, as my God. Okay, that's Jacob. Well, the great news about Jacob is that he didn't stay that way. He didn't stay in the state of the Lord is not my God. And it all changed that night in Genesis 32 when he wrestled with the man who was God. And he got his hip put out of joint. Pretty painful. And he emerges that night really with something very new. And the something very new was the Lord was his God. The Lord was his God. And to commemorate that great change that happened in Jacob, he got a new name, Israel. So it's it, it, now, <clears throat> as we've read about the the life of Jacob in Genesis, it's all been very exhausting. It's very exhausting for us to follow Jacob through one struggle in his life after the other to the point where he got broken and he finally is, is he, he's, the Lord is his God. But it, it's very important for us if, if, to, to see this. It's very personal for us, very personal application. That's why more than half of the book of Genesis is about this person. Jacob, of all the characters in the book of Genesis, more is written about Jacob than any other character. That's why, because there's a Jacob inside of each one of us. And, 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 and God, <clears throat> and, and, there's, and the Jacob inside of us is, 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 does the same thing. It says, thank you to God, but no thank you. Thank you, but no thank you. I want to do it my way. And that leads to this life of struggles and frustrations that we've been reading all about. But finally comes the night. As I mentioned here, when <clears throat> the night of the breaking, when, when, when Jacob is broken, he emerges, a new, new, he emerges out a new man. He's a born-again man. He's a new man. He's a born-again man. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. So, well, now he's approaching his death. He's approaching his death. And that means that Jacob is approaching what the Bible calls the shining light that shineth more and more Unto the perfect day. It's so hot in here. I think I'm approaching my death. I don't, it's like, hey Tim, you want? Can you? Do you think you could figure out how to? Crank? Anyway, <clears throat> all right. So Jacob now he's approaching his death, and that means that he's. That, and, 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 and so, like I said, Proverbs 4:18. Proverbs 4:18 is the verse. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. That's what's happening. See, that, verse 29, when it says that the, uh, the time was coming when Jacob must die, it's telling us Jacob is winning. Jacob is winning. He's approaching death. He's not just going to heaven. He's going to heaven triumphantly. He's approaching death in verse 29. He's not just drifting into heaven's harbor. He's sailing in with full sails and a spinnaker. 
<laughs> you know, he's really coming in as, as uh, winning. He's coming in, verse 29, he's winning. So different from when Frank Sinatra did die. And as he approached death in that hospital bed in Cedar sinai in Beverly Hills, and with, with, his, with, with his wife, Barbara, the only person that was with him, he was fighting, and she was saying to you know, him, keep fighting, keep fighting, try to, try to breathe. He had trouble breathing. Try to breathe. And his last words were, I'm losing. I'm losing. It's so different. Just like, just like Ron Myers, who, like Jacob, just approached death. Ron was winning. Jacob was winning. So with the start of verse 29 now, we've come to the beginning now of the last section in, 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 in uh, the, let's just say, the last chapter, so to speak, in Jacob's life. And, and, and this last chapter here in Jacob's life, which is the chapter of his death, will be from this verse through to the end of the book, will be the preparation for his death, his death and his burial. That's what we're going to have here in the rest of the book of Genesis. So from verse 29, with the approach of death for Jacob, we have really the, the approach of the death of the last of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's death is going to be for us the conclusion of the book of Genesis. It's going to be the conclusion of the history of the beginnings, the hist God's history of the beginnings. So now that Jacob knows that he must die, there's something very pressing on him. Something is really bothering him. And you can see that when it says that he, in verse 29, verse 29, he called his son Joseph, said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight. Now look at this. He says, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I'll lie with my fathers. Thou shalt carry me out of Egypt. Bury me in their burying place. And then Joseph responds, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, swear unto me. And he swear unto him. And then he bows himself upon the bed's head. So he calls Joseph. He probably had a messenger go and call Joseph. And he starts out by saying, in verse 29, if now I have found grace in thy sight, put I pray thee. He says, if I found grace in thy sight. This is the patriarch, Jacob, speaking to his son, Joseph. I mean, this shows us the humility of Jacob to say to his son, if I found grace in thy sight. He's appealing to his son's affections to him as a father. And he asks him, put your hand under my thigh, which was a custom uh, of the strongest vow possible. And the whole idea with the hand under the thigh was that the person who was making the promise that, that it was to see that the person he was promising to was putting his whole being in his hand. He was depending on him. He was relying on him. So th what's important for us to see here is this strong determination that Jacob had to bring his body out of Egypt. And he binds Joseph with the strongest oath possible. So who else in Genesis used this method of, this, uh, of the hand under the thigh? Who else? Right, it was Abraham. Abraham for Isaac. Right, it was Abraham for Isaac. As in Genesis 24. We remember when it says, Abraham said unto the eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I'll make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of Canaanites among whom I dwell. I shall go unto my country, which happened to be Syria, and to my kindred, which happened to be Syrians, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now, why was it so important for Abraham that his son Isaac not marry a Canaanite? What would be wrong with marrying one of the local girls? What was it? They're okay? <laughs> so, all right. Great sinners in the areas of sexuality. Sodom and Gomorrah, that's Canaan. Great sinners in the area of idolatry, idolatry. And so why was it important, why was it so important that, that Abraham not marry one of these Canaanite women? Is because 
he knew he, his son could very easily be drawn away from God. I mean, the promises of God to make a great nation from Abraham and, and, and to bless all the families of the earth and to bring forth the deliverer through Abraham, it all had come down to one person, to Isaac. It was all in Isaac. Everything was resting on Isaac. Isaac was Abraham's only son. Now, <clears throat> when you think about Isaac and the history you know about Isaac, what kind of a person, I mean, how would you describe Isaac? What kind of person was Isaac, would you say? Was he a bold, strong character, or was he more the timid, retir retiring type? What are you going to say? Okay. He was mama's boy. He was more the timid, retiring type. You remember? Sarah, his mother Sarah was dominant, with a capital D, <laughs> over Isaac, right? And we saw that, you know, when, 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 uh, when, um, <coughs> when, 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 when uh, Ishmael was mocking Isaac, and boy, did Sarah come up. Uh, she came up with fire and fury. <laughs> she, she said in Genesis 21.10, Genesis 21.10, Wherefore Sarah said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman, that would be Hagar, and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So, Pretty strong person, and then uh, and 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 by the way, um, Rebecca was kind of a strong person too. Uh, she was the one who told uh, Jacob, "Go deceive your father, obey my voice." I don't know why the patriarchs married such strong women, but they did, and that's just the way it is. I don't want you to think that there's any strong women among the Jewish people today. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> anyway. And then you remember Isaac, that he retreated from taking a stand against the Philistines who stole his wells. They stole his wells in Genesis 26, 15. Genesis 26, 15. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines st stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. Now, you know, they steal his wells. And then he come, the, the, the king of the Philistines comes and says, you're stronger than us. So what does Isaac do? Does he say, yeah, you're right, I'll show you. No. In verse 17, Isaac departed and, and pitched his tent in Gerar. So Isaac was a non-confrontational person. I mean, you know, he, he, he was just a, uh, he was a gentle soul, so to speak, you know. And the picture that we have of Isaac that really characterizes his life is Genesis 24, 63. Genesis 24, 63, where it says, Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. He just liked to go into the quiet fields and meditate and be with God. That was Isaac. He wasn't trying to conquer the world. You know, he just wanted to spend time alone with God. That's why he lived the longest of all the three patriarchs, because he, he wasn't prone to having heart attacks. He, 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 he would rather eat lunch. Anyway, but, but Abraham knew all this about his son Isaac, and Abraham knew that a wife would make or break Isaac. So Abraham was very concerned to make sure that Isaac did not get a wife from the Canaanites. And, he, and, and, and Abraham, Abraham himself, he would have gone out himself and, gone a, and, and gotten a wife for Isaac, but he was too old. He was too weak at the time, as Genesis 24 uh, Genesis 24, 1 opens up. Genesis 24, open, 24, 1 opens with Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I'll make thee swear. And, and, and <coughs> so that's why Abraham showed such a strong determination for Isaac to not marry a Canaanite. Not a Canaanite woman. And that's why Abraham used this method of, of the hand under the thigh as the strongest vow that he could get from Eliezer, his servant, in his house, who had uh, jurisdiction over everything in his house, to get a wife for, for Isaac from Syria. So this is the only time in Abraham's life when we ever see someone, ever see him making a vow like that. This is the only time in Jacob's life. We ever see him making a vow like getting a vow like that? It shows a strong determination, and that determination, verse twenty nine: "Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt." Now, can you imagine Joseph? 
and how this made him felt, all the emotion, his old father. Now, he's got his hand under his thigh. He's like he's holding his father. He's so close to him, you know, face to face. And, and he says to him, bury me not in Egypt. Carry me out of Egypt. Bury me in the burying place of my fathers. Now, uh, what else could Joseph have said at that time other than what he said in verse 30 and verse 30? I will do as thou hast said. I will do as thou hast said. Okay, so Joseph has now promised that he's going to do what Jacob has asked him to do. But was that really enough for Jacob? Was that enough? Was Jacob satisfied with Joseph just saying that in verse 30? I will do as thou hast said. Was it? No. No. No, it wasn't. It wasn't enough. Because Jacob went on to say in verse 31, swear unto me. Swear unto me. Now, when, when, when Joseph did swear to Jacob that he would not bury him in Egypt, he'd carry his father, he'd carry his, father his remains out. Was that enough? Yes. That was enough. Uh, how do you know he was satisfied? How do you know it was enough? Because of verse 31, Israel bowed himself upon the bed's post. He's, Jacob, you see him in this finally resting. He's finally got what he wanted. I mean, this is a lot of drama. There's a lot of drama right now over getting assurance that, 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 that Jacob was not going to be buried in Egypt. But notice how Jacob, in all of this drama, is called Israel. He is Israel in all this drama. So it wasn't Jacob who was agitated not to be buried in Egypt. It was Israel, which shows that the person who was all agitated was the man who was the prince of God. Now, when you compare the deaths of the three patriarchs, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what was there that was different about Jacob's death compared to the je- deaths of Abraham and Isaac? What would you say? Something was different about Jacob's death compared to Abraham and Isaac's. Simple question. Not complicated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Unlike Abraham and Isaac, Jacob died in a foreign land. He died in a foreign land. And that was what was so strong on Jacob's mind. He was sitting there thinking, he was sitting to himself, my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, they died in the land of Canaan. I'm not going to die in that land. I'm going to die in Egypt. So why should it matter? Why should it matter to Jacob where he's buried? After all, what difference does it make whether they're Canaanite worms or Egyptian worms that are going to eat his body? What difference does it make? Well, it was important. It was important for Jacob because Jacob wanted in his burial to make a last statement to the world that he was turning his back on everything that Egypt had, all the pleasures and all the idolatry, and he chose to be buried, to not be buried in Egypt. Bury me not in Egypt. And that was a statement of faith. And he knew that, that he was being watched. Jacob knew he was being watched. Jacob knew he was being watched by his children. He knew he was being watched by his grandchildren. And he just wanted this last statement to be very, very clear that that Egypt was not the home uh, of the people of God, but heaven was the home. Now, that's a lesson for us. That's a lesson for us to realize we're being watched. We're being watched in the decisions we make, and we're helping to guide those. when, when, And that's why he says so strongly in verse 30, 30, I will lie with my fathers. He's saying, I'm, he's saying, uh, I'm not going to turn away from the faith of Abraham and Isaac, and therefore it's important you bury me with them. Now, what's important was it's not the ceremony of how he died. You know, like a, like, like, like a friend told me recently, he said, Tom, with you going skiing now, he says, you know, we're going to get a phone call that you hit some tree. So we think that you, you should do your own service now. You should plan it all out. <laughs> so, uh, well, that wasn't imp- what, what was important during the memorial service for, or the flowers or anything like that. It was the place. It was the place where he would be buried. And he says, carry me out of Egypt. Now, he has to re- Jacob has to rely on Joseph to carry his body out of Egypt, and that's why he worked to get this oath from him to carry him out of Egypt. And, and sometimes we are so weak and we are so defeated that, that, that we just don't have the strength, you know, and, 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 and that's the time really to pray to God, Lord, I'm in a temptation right now. Carry me out of Egypt. 
you know, and, and anyway, he wants to be buried in Canaan, and his last statement is going to be that. So that's what he wanted, and, and he wanted to be in this cave that, um, of Machpelah that Abraham had purchased and that Abraham was buried in, Sarah was buried in, uh, actually uh, Leah was buried there, Isaac was buried there, Rebecca was buried there. And, uh, <coughs> and so it's now a mosque. Nothing's perfect, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, <coughs> so anyway, so now, so then, then he bows himself on the post. Now, there's, there's, it says bedpost. There's only one Hebrew vowel difference between bedpost and staff. Might have been a staff. The Septuagint translates as a staff. We're not going to argue. But what a victory that was for Jacob had. What an example of a life that's victorious. You know, it, <clears throat> bury me not means the world's not my home. Okay, so he wants to be carried out. He wants to be buried in this place. He says, I will lie with my fathers. Now, here it's important to, to, to when he says in verse 30, I will lie with my fathers. Here it's important for us to get a little bit deeper than the English. Because the King James is just not reflecting what the Hebrew is stating. See, when Jacob said in the Hebrew, what Jacob said in the Hebrew was more of a sequence. He says, first, I will lie with my fathers. Then you will carry me out of Egypt. Then you will bury me in the burying place. So the, the New American Standard got it right, and the NIV got it right too. So the New American Standard translates it like this. When I lie with my fathers... <clears throat> You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. See? And, and the NIV says, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt. So <clears throat> the Hebrew here that the, the NIV and the New England Standard got right is very important. Because the, it, it, when you read this first, the way it is here in the King James, it makes it sound like Jacob will lie with his fathers when Joseph buries him in the cave that they're buried in. And that's not what he said. And that's why the word when is very critical for, for an understanding here, what Jacob is saying. When I lie with my fathers. He say, when I lie with my fathers. <coughs> it's very important. When I lie with my fathers. So, 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 so why this is so important is, is, is it shows to us an understanding that Jacob had about death. Jacob described his death as being immediately united with his fathers. And then later his body would be buried with their bodies where they were buried. And that's exactly how Jacob's death is described when he does come to die in Genesis 49.33. In Genesis 49.33 it says, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. See, right there it identifies that as soon as he died in, in, in Genesis 49, 33, as soon as he died, it says he was gathered to his people. Describes a sequence here. You know, keep your eye on the feet. His feet go into the bed. He stops breathing. He's gathered to his people. That verse is stating that as soon as he gave up the ghost or breathed his last breath, <clears throat> at that moment he was united with his father's. That was, the, that was the moment of his death. He was united with the fathers. Then the next chapter, which is chapter 50, we read what actually happened to his body. And it says in chapter 50, verse 1, Joseph fell upon his father's face, wept upon him, kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, and the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. So are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed, and the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Wow. So when the, that's 70. So when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I found grace in your, in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bow, bury me. Now, therefore, let me go, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I'll come again. So there's 40 days of embalming during the same time, let's just say. There's 70 days of mourning. So it's 70 days later, at least. It's more than 70 days later. 
because, you know, they got to get the caravan ready and, you know, make the request and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it, we really could be talking about approaching three months. So three months after he dies, his body is carried up to Machpelah there and buried with his fathers. Now, Jacob knew that he would be embalmed and that and that and and and, and he said that you know that as soon as he died he would be united he, he, as soon as he died he would be united with his fathers but 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 what he said was that when i die i will immediately be united with my fathers and that's how jacob understood death the same way as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.8. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. As soon as we die, we are absent from the body as Jacob was and will be present with the Lord just as Jacob was. See, that's why Psalm 73, Psalm 73.23 describes death like this. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holding me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. See, David described life and death as a state of being continually with God. And life is, is, is being guided by the counsel of God, and afterlife is to, be re, is to be received up to glory, which is what the Lord Jesus prayed. The Lord Jesus prayed that in John 17, 24. John 17, 24, he said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me. I am continually with thee, where I am, that they may behold, behold my glory, afterward receive me to glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So what Jacob was saying here was no matter where he died, that he would be with the fathers. His soul and his spirit would be with his fathers. And since his fathers were with Jehovah Jesus, they would be with Jehovah Jesus. I mean, he could say, Jacob could say, if I die in Egypt, I'll go immediately to my fathers. If I die in Canaan, I'll go immediately to my fathers. No matter where I die, I'm going immediately to my fathers. Now, people sometimes ask me, do the Jewish people believe in an afterlife? They ask that question. Do the Jewish people believe in an afterlife? Well, the Jewish people today don't think about the afterlife, and, 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 and today the afterlife for the Jewish people is that they don't see any particulars about it. They don't really see the afterlife clearly. It's kind of fuzzy. It's kind of haz hazy. That's not the way it was for the Old Testament saints. It's not the way it was. What Jacob said here is proof that the Old Testament saints look forward to the afterlife with a certainty, with a clarity of vision, where for them there was no doubt about it. They were going to be reunited with fellow believers or united with believers. Jacob, along with all the Old Testament saints, believed that at the time of death you go to the fathers and that later you, 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 they bury, in his case, bury his remains with their remains. And that's a great encouragement for us, great encouragement for the family of Jeffrey Whitkey, missionary in, in, who's been kidnapped in Africa for so long, hasn't been heard from. But whether or not Jacob's body was buried in Egypt or Canaan, that all depended on Joseph. And that's a very important for, for, for Jacob to make this statement here. And, and because what he was saying here with this burying in, in, in Canaan was the, was the continuation of what he said to Pharaoh. What he said to Pharaoh in Genesis 47.9 Genesis 47, 9, Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. He sees his whole life as a pilgrimage. Jacob sees his life as, and he wanted to be known as a pilgrim. And now he's in Egypt, and now things have really changed for Jacob. I mean, he's got the best that he's ever had in life. He's got wealth. He's got an abundance of food. He's got pleasures. I mean, what Pharaoh said to him as a promise in Genesis 45, 20 when he came, Genesis 45, 20, regard not your stuff. The good of all the land of Egypt is yours. It's all yours. But Jacob's heart was now exercised and really worked up that he wanted to make, make sure everybody knew none of those things moved him. None of those things moved him away from his pilgrimage. And his last gesture is going to be to, be, to where he's going to be buried is going to make that statement loud and clear. You know, it's just like, um, just like John Newton wrote in his hymn, uh, come, come, my soul, thy suit prepare. When he, when he wrote, show me what I have to do. Every hour my strength renew. 
Let me live the life of faith. Let me die thy people's death. This is Jacob dying the people of God's death. Um, Now, so it's a great example for us because here we live in America's finest city in San Diego. (laughs) And when the world sides up against us in San Diego and says, friend, that we don't turn back to the world and say, friend. But just like Jacob, we continue on, and like the hymns and, and like the hymn says, we're going in the way of the hymn says, the faith of our fathers or that old time religion, and reject any friendship with the world. That's what he's doing here, and this has an impact uh, 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 on 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 uh, Jacob. As soon as he gets this promise, he bows his head upon the bed's head. Very symbolic. He's like turning his back on Egypt, turning his back on the world when he bows his head there and he turns to God. Just like it says in Hebrews 11.38. Hebrews 11.38 says, of whom the world was not worthy. It wasn't worth it to them. They wandered in deserts, mountains, caves, dens. They all died having retained a good report through faith, not receiving the promises God had provided for them. So better thing for us. That they without us should not be made perfect. So that's interesting it says that because what it says there when Jacob says he wants to be gathered with his fathers, in other words, he, the, the, there's a completeness there, a sense of completeness. God has it that Jacob without his fathers would not be complete. God has it that Jacob without us should not be complete. God has it so that Jacob without all the saints Uh, 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 will not be complete until the whole church, the whole Israel of God is complete, all gathered around the Lord Jesus in heaven. That's the full meaning of to be gathered with the fathers, to be gathered with the fathers. It's an eventual gathering together of all the saints together. Now we come now to chapter 48. And what's interesting about chapter 48 is this is, of course, the last section of Genesis, which comes in three chapters, 48, 49, and 50. So we stand here, we look over these three chapters, and, and it really it's chapter 49 that's the climax. Why? Because that's the chapter where the 12 sons of Jacob are blessed and their futures are foretold. Now you think about the book of Genesis, you think about the book of beginnings, and you ask yourself the, the question, what is the beginnings about? What's the beginnings about? Well, of course, the beginning is the book of creation, and so that began the earth, the heavens, man, plant life, animal life, and it's all the, be- but it's also the beginning of sin and the, and the fall of man. But this book of beginnings has a far more significant history or beginning in it because this book of beginnings has a history of the beginning of redemption. It's the beginning of the the salvation. It's the beginning of God's rescue for man. So that's the reason why the most important verse in the book of Genesis is Genesis 3.15 where it says that God was going to put enmity between the woman and, and her seed, the seed of the woman, and, and, the, and, and the devil. And the seed of the woman was going to b- crush the head of the devil, but, but the devil was going to bruise his heel in the process. So this is where God reveals that his plan of salvation was for a man to be born who was very unique. He's the only man who was ever called in his Bible the seed of the woman. Later he calls himself the seed of man. He would only have the, 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 this term. He's the only one. So in this book of beginnings, it's really the beginning of the revelation that man is going to be redeemed. Man's going to be saved. Man's going to be rescued by this man who's called the seed of the woman. So from this point, from that point in Genesis 3.15, all eyes were looking for that special man who was called the seed of the woman. And from that point, there was like a hunger, there was like a yearning to, to find this special man. Where is the seed of the woman that's going to save man from their sin? So from Genesis 3.15, the only thing that we learned about this special person, and it was going to be called the seed of the woman, but the second most important verse in the Bible, and you may not have thought of it this way, it, 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 it tells us more about the seed of the woman and, and why, and the second most important verse is chapter 4, verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now you may look at that and say, so what? That's nothing. It says, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So you say, well, what's that so important about? All this thing is that Eve had a baby named Cain, and she got him from the Lord. That's all. No, no. That verse is so important 
because it's what Eve actually said in the Hebrew that makes it so astounding. Now, it's translated, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That's not what she said. That's not what Eve said, and the Hebrew is crystal clear. As a matter of fact, I've oftentimes wondered, why didn't any translator get this right? And I'm not saying anything, but I'm just saying this. It says this in Hebrew, kaniti ish et uh, Yahweh, or uh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Kaniti means I have gotten, and ish is man, I have so. And et is who is, it's a direct object, and Yahweh is God, or, or Jehovah. So what she really said here when her firstborn was, was born was that I have gotten a man who is God. That's what she said. And there was Eve. She had fallen into this terrible condition of sin. She has just heard from God that a man is going to be born called the seed of the woman. This man would save her from her sins. And when she gives birth to her first son, son she assumes, well, here he is. I've just gotten the seed of the woman who would, who would now save her. But she didn't know that wasn't the one, but never mind. But what was astounding was what she did know when she called him, this is the man who is God. Now, that's why Genesis 4.1 is such an important verse in Genesis because it shows that Eve understood that the Savior was going to be both man and God. What Eve said in Genesis 4.1, she understood that when God was standing before her in Genesis 3.15 and said the seed of the woman was going to enter, enter into a bloody combat, com, com, bloody fight with, with, with the devil, and was going to save man. He was going to have his, by, by, by crushing the head of the devil, he was also going to get his heel uh, crushed. Eve understood that God was saying to her, and I'm going to be that man. That's what she knew. She knew that God would become man, the seed of the woman, and would crush the head of the Satan, of the Satan and his heel would be crushed. So Genesis 4.1 is really the beginning of the revelation that the Savior would be God, who became man. See, when she said that, she revealed she already knew the truth of Isaiah 9.6. Isaiah 9.6, which says, unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called the mighty God. She knew that. So what happened in Genesis 4.1 was that a child was born to Eve, and she called the name of the child the mighty God. Now, now, Eve was expecting her child was going to be the mighty God and that he would immediately crush the head of Satan and then save them from their sins. She should know there was a little 4,000 years or so before it was actually going to happen that the man who was going to be born who was to be called the mighty God, but okay. So then what happened in, in Genesis, and then three men emerge, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and from them spring 12 men who are the 12 tribes of Israel who become the people of Israel, become the Jewish people, and it would be from these people that finally the child is going to be born who's called the mighty God. That's going to be the seed of the woman who's called the mighty God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls himself the Son of Man. And that's why chapter 49 is the climax of this last section of the three chapters of Genesis, because this is the launch. This is the launch of the 12 tribe people of Israel into the coming sea of humanity. And, and through this people, through these 12 tribes, God is going to bring the seed of the woman. God is going to bring that man, that man who is God, to save man from their sins. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Through this people of these 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel, God will give his book to man, the Bible. And through this people, God will bring his knowledge, the knowledge of God, across the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. And that's why we could call the book of Genesis the book of launching, the book of launching, because the book of Genesis is ending with this launching of the people of Israel who will bring the Savior, who will bring God's book, the revelation of God, the Bible, into the world. So that's why chapter 49 is, is the climax of the section, and chapter 48 is this, the, the natural introduction. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing the seed of the woman yourself, Lord Jesus, into the world to save man. And now, Lord, as we as we are getting ready now to look at these last three chapters here, we pray that you would open our eyes more to see the wonders of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.